Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. I am your host, weekly host, Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. And thanks for watching this replay. Today's episode is two hours difference because of our guest who's located in California. Um, I like to accommodate the guests and their time zones. But for those of you that are new, my name's Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center where we teach people all across the world through our live streams. Um, and we teach them how to understand behavior through working with animals using positive reinforcement and applied behavior analysis. Good morning, Daphne. I got your Christmas card the other day. Thank you. Hey, Krista, good to see you again. Just saw you last night. Tim, faithful follower. Everybody's a faithful follower, most everybody. Um, yeah, so for those of you that are new, we usually go live every Sunday morning with Coffee with the Critters at 9 a.m. Unless we're interviewing somebody and they're on a different time zone or uh, my travel schedule is really picking up. Um, I will be in Chicago next week. I do plan on going live with you at 9 a.m., but I'm going to be doing something completely new that I've never done on the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page before with Coffee with Critters. So you'll definitely wanna join me next Sunday morning. Is there a time zone difference? I don't think so anymore. Um, at 9 a.m. I will be going live from Chicago. Yay. So every, if I can, um, wherever I am on location, I'm going to take coffee with the critters with me. Hello, Elaine, Ray, Katie, Jeannie, Nicole, Sandy. There's our manager, Karen Pratt. Um, hey, Carrie, Beth, Violet. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Okay. So I have a couple of things I want to talk about before we bring on Melody, who is our guest today. Um, we've been pretty busy here at the Animal Behavior Center. Um, like I said, all of our services are via our live streams. Good morning, Lou. Um, so for those of you that were with us last night, in the parrot project um we're doing if you're not if you love birds and you're not in the parrot project you're gonna definitely want to take a look at it um we are on the cutting edge of um teaching parrot lovers not just parrot we do have some pigeon people in there we do have some bird trainers raptor trainers in there um last night we had something exclusive where we bring people who are subscribers special holiday discounts for uh, different things parrot related that the discounts are exclusive to the parrot project. Um, and we have two more coming up before Christmas. So um, for those of you that are new as well, we have our level one and our level two memberships. They're online memberships, online learning, learning at your fingertips, at your convenience. And um, if you're looking for level one is for companion animal people who have companion animals. Level two is primarily for people who are in the field or thinking about getting in the field of animal training or behavior and uh, or people that just wanna know more about how to use applied behavior analysis with animals. We also have our projects with our species specific. Um, these make great holiday gifts and we have people already buying them for um, rescues and people on their holiday list. So um, Melody and I were just talking about this right before. Uh, Melody's in the lobby waiting with another special guest. Um, our podcasts are extremely popular. Um, those you, you will find, they're hour-long podcasts that we publish monthly, very in-detailed. Those are also and only available through our memberships. Um, and I'm just going through a couple of different things for those that are thinking about knowing better and doing better with their animals in the coming new year. We have our webinars. We just had this one last week, but it's we have them recorded and they're on our um, website, which is the animalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, we also have there are a lot of different webinars. We've got this one coming up to this Tuesday night understanding behavior. So for those of you that have people on your holiday list and you're not sure what to purchase them, um, if you go to, what does that say? Shop? Yeah. 
Um, and then you'll find our webinars. You'll find different things on there, like our, our sets of mugs. We have two more added to this. Who are they? <laughs> um, Sam and Rocky. How could I forget? Um, so take a look through our shop and you can find the different things we own such or that we sell such as, uh, and we only sell what we use. Um, our treat pouches for an array of different animals. Um, if you go on there, you'll find out why we use these particular ones. And then we have our t-shirts, our sweatshirts. We also have our stations, our target sticks, which we use on all the animals. Um, Karen has put together, our, our manager has put together, you can buy these things as a package. And there, went through it all. Melody, you ready to come on? <laughs> so we have Melody Hennig, which um, I'm going to introduce her. She is also, um, I'll bring her on first, but she is also the owner of Busy Beaks Academy, and we're going to ask her a little bit about what she does. Melody, I'm going to go ahead and bring you on. Here she comes. Hey, Melody, good to see you. Hi. Good morning. <laughs> um, so thanks for coming on today. Yeah, um, thank you for having me. Yeah, this has been like a long time in the works. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for adjusting around our schedule, which is kind of hairy carry through the holidays. Um, so I'm going to introduce Melody. Um, Melody, how did we find out about each other? Is it through Vicki Ronchetti or? It, either through Vicki or through Kim Silver. Oh, Kim Silver. Yay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I met her out at uh, Best Friends in April. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Um, all right. Um, Kim Silver is a professional dog trainer in Arizona, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this is Melody. Um, she is a registered veterinary technician and head trainer at the Medical Center for Birds in Oakley, California. She is also the creator of Busy Beaks Academy and a graduate of the uh, Karen Pryor Academy. Did I get that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. And who is your guest with you today? Uh, this is Sage. She's a 16-year-old uh, brown-headed parrot. She's been with me for about 10 years. Um, and she's been to lots of conferences and, you know, we're real close to UC Davis. So she's a real uh, seasoned teacher. So... She comes with me to a lot of these things. That's nice. And um, it's nice that your work lets you come on Coffee with Critters this morning. When I saw this morning you were headed to work, I was like, wow, that's nice. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so, um, Melody, before we get started, do you want to give us a little bit? I mean, I want to talk about Busy Beaks, um, but I want to, uh, let's see. Can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got started? Yeah, so I, um, let's see, um, I graduated tech school in 2008, and that's when I started working here at the Medical Center for Birds, and I think when I was in tech school, they gave us um, about six hours of anything to do with birds, and so a lot of what I've learned has been, you know, here on the job. Um, and unfortunately, I think that's what a lot of veterinarians get now, too. Um, you kind of skimmed over. Um, but anyhow, I started working here um, even before I had graduated tech school. So I've been here for 10 years. So you uh, work with more than just birds, right? We're just birds. Oh, you are just birds. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Good. Feathers and no feathers and, you know, beaks and no beaks sometimes. <laughs> Raptors, all different kinds of birds. At raptors, local zoos, and rehabs, and, and anything from budgies to ibises. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. it's really it's really cool. So, do you agree with me that, um, like I tell people, you can read as much as you want and be as book smart as you want, but so much comes through the application. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's you know we we learn things in in tech school that are you know they're hands-on and that's how you get that practice and that muscle memory even like watching their body language you have to practice it and you know it's like you said earlier um everything's different when you go live so <laughs> that's why you have to come and practice it um so yeah i absolutely agree with that 
So in your studies through your vet tech, was that, that wasn't geared just towards birds, right? No, not at all. No, that's, um, you know, primarily for dogs and cats. And that's mostly what's out there, at least in this area. Um, so that's what working here, you know, as kind of a clean slate um, is where I learned um, what I know about birds. And um, luckily, my boss is he's a huge um, behavior nerd and a huge training nerd. And so who's your boss? Uh, oh, Dr. Brian Spear. Oh, OK. Yeah. 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 So he's I mean, he's a huge nerd anyway. But <laughs> you start talking about skulls and beaks and behavior and it's like he's gone. You, you have to reel him back in. Um, and so that's what got me started. I went to my first. Um, conference was a three-day conference at the Gabriel Foundation with Dr. Susan Friedman and Barbara Heidenreich in 2009, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's when everything else started. It's been pretty much all of my free time is just hanging out at home with my kids and whatever I can get my hands on as far as training. So was, um, are birds or were birds your interest in why you went to vet tech school? My very first pet was a cockatiel when I was nine, and we were inseparable. And so I didn't think I was going to end up working with birds, but literally nobody's surprised. So it, it just ended up that way, and it's perfect. Good. Um, so then, I mean, that's awesome that you're right there and you can work for somebody that specializes in a, a medical center that specializes just in birds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Cause a lot of times when people contact me here locally for what vet do you use? Where do you go? We use a couple of different vets here. Right. Um, um, one being the former, one of the former um, zoo vets for the Toledo zoo. He's uh -huh. back. So um, <clears throat> one of the things I tell people when they're asking for a vet for their bird I highly suggest that they look into somebody that specializes in birds uh -huh. because they're so different than cats and dogs. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, some people are asking what kind of parrot is that? Oh, she's a brown headed parrot. And you said she's 15 years old. Yeah. Yeah. She, they're, they're kind of like the, um, the, uh, underdog of the Senegal same family okay not quite as popular okay um yeah somebody's carry out says on here for most of my parents life she's had the best avian vet yes Dr. Driggers Dr. Driggers yeah. is awesome and he's in the parrot project he's um we go live with him several times um okay so how, how long have you been at the center where you're at now um 10 years Wow. So you've got mm -hmm. a lot of experience. You've probably seen a lot come through. Yeah, and but the thing, we still see new things every day. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is a tough question I'm going to ask you. Um, yeah. Get asked all the time. You're probably like, great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she just laughed too. <laughs> if you had one tip to give to any animal or parrot owner, what do you think it would be? Mm. that's a tough one yeah you know I think that a lot of the clients that we see um, you know it when I have to bring my own kids in and, and I'm the client um, I'm a nervous wreck and if I could just share something with people it would be that you know if especially if it's a routine thing you know your bird's healthy you don't have to do everything in, in one go and if you are nervous and your bird is nervous and we can see that your bird is, is afraid of the towel or the stethoscope or just the general process that we're going through, you know, we can help you through that. We can break things up and we can kind of teach them that what's going to happen is not always a bad thing. And that, you know, helps them be more resilient and have a more positive um, reinforcement history with that. So uh, that's, Part of what I do here is that, you know, our doctors have a half hour exam time 
And that is to um, make sure that your bird's healthy, address the questions that you have, talk about their findings. Um, many times they'll split things up, especially if it's a new bird. Hi, I've met you, I've met your bird. Can we come back in two weeks and then do blood work? Right, and so um, if at that point we notice that the bird has a aversion to the towel, they, they fly away when they see the towel or heaven forbid they do an alarm call or something like that, then that's where I come in and go, hey, let's give you some homework, let's practice on this, you know, and Hopefully, um, we have people who come from not so close also, but for our clients who live really close, we encourage them to, to come in and we can check your body weight and I will shower your bird in treats and then you can leave. And that's one more good experience that you have here. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, things that we can do to help you feel more comfortable and help your bird be more comfortable to process and one of those things I think that we do is that we do just about everything in the exam room with the owner. So our, our blood draws, our groomings, um, our sinus flushes, even though they get all over the floor. Um, you know, I think that helps people a lot. It's just, you know, kind of seeing what's happening instead of the, we're all used to the whisk your baby in the back and then we don't know what happens from there. Um, um, one of the things, there's a couple different vets that I use. Um, and one, Dr. Myers, when I take the birds in and people who follow our personal face, my personal Facebook page, I post a lot about the vet visit. Uh -huh. um, Rocky. And I continue to take Rocky to the vet because uh -huh. he likes the vet tech. So yeah. he, knows, he knows when um, Dr. Myers is done uh, Rocky is handed over to Carol because Rocky is no. trained. Mm -hmm. Rocky is handed over to Carol. Um, he gets to bounce and sing to Carol, and Carol takes him in the other room and gets him weighed, and she mm -hmm. gets down on the floor with him because the scale is down yeah. the floor. And she takes the time, um, and so does the vet, just to do whatever to help reinforce calm behavior with the vet. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's real important. And you know, anytime, sometimes, most of the time, when I get called in to work with a client, is after the exam, maybe after the blood draw, after the grooming, and birds like, oh, I'm so done, like ready to go home. Sometimes just the cuddling, or if they will take a treat, and then I'm like on cloud nine, you know, after all this stuff, and then you'll take a treat. But yeah, those things are super important. Yeah, and if the bird will take a treat at the vet clinic, especially after certain procedures have done have been done, that's a sign to me that if they're going to eat, they're not too stressed. Yeah, absolutely. I always like to joke with people that they're they're not like me; they don't stress eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we have um, we have all of our rooms are um, geared with different kinds of treats, it, and um, we have. Uh, a coat hanger that's just full of uh, treat bags too that people can take in the exam room so we're prepared or armed and ready. Good, good. Um, and with that, I mean, because you have a history in uh, behavior and training, hence your work with busy, your owner of busybeaks.com, Busy Beaks Academy, sorry. Um, one of reinforcers aren't always treats. I know mm -hmm. with Rico, when he was done being toweled in the exam room, I had asked the vet and the vet techs, his major form of reinforcement is attention. So when he would come out of the towel, he was allowed to fly around the room, land back on whoever he wanted to, and we all made a big deal clapping yep. and he started bouncing. Uh -huh. Yeah, that yep. was Rico's reinforcer. Mm -hmm. Rico and Rocky, both of their reinforcers is, is the attention that comes afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of birds like that. So if you had to, I'm scrolling through the comments. If you had to suggest what are some of the different things um, people can do to train at home to get prepared for the vet visit with their birds? Yeah. So, um, uh, well, um, there's lots of different things that you might run into at the vet. You know, the towel is one of those. Um, and sometimes, you know, just depending on the context of the towel. Um, so the towel at the vet hospital is different than the towel at home. 
on the dining room table or after a shower or whatever. Um, but if your bird is comfortable with the towel in any of those contexts, then you can try and generalize it out. So if Sage is comfortable stepping up to a towel after a shower and we can kind of pat her down, then you can work with that. You can rub her and then offer her reinforcement or we use the towel in the kitchen instead or, you know, different places. Um, the more different places that she sees the towel and either she's reinforced for interacting with it or it's paired with something that she likes, um, then we can kind of hope that that generalizes out. Sure. So, yeah. Start shaping from where they're already comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have a comment or question that keeps coming up and it's from the awesome Julie Clark. She wants to know mm -hmm. what range your bird's eating right now. Oh my gosh, my bird's obsessed with peas. <laughs> it's the number one reinforcer is peas and pomegranate juice, and I have no idea why. Um, but she's real good with her her broccoli, and she loves bell peppers. She's actually was really good with her vegetables and fruit and really anything. Um, I have to mind her weight. <laughs> so if she likes, um, I like your super your Wonder Woman cup too. Thank you. <laughs> if she likes um, pomegranate juice, mm -hmm. um, do you do you use that to reinforce through her syringe for taking a nasty medication? Yeah. So um, actually, when I first got her, um, she had uh, she was surrendered to our hospital, and I'm just grateful every day that we're at a hospital that if a bird does come um, that they need to be surrendered, that we look for a home for them. Uh, but anyhow, she was surrendered because she had chewed off one of her toes. And so she learned how to take medication from a syringe before I even knew she liked pomegranate juice. And one of the things that I hear from clients a lot is, oh, well, I can just give them juice in the syringe and they'll take that. But you just have to keep in mind that um, the juice may be just as bad as the medication if they've never had it before um but she will drink all of the pomegranate juice in the world from a syringe um but you know having had offered it to her out of a syringe first then i knew oh now i can put it in a syringe so if you know that your bird already likes juice then you can absolutely try it from a syringe absolutely um, talking about that, let's, mm -hmm. let's go from here. Um, cause I know when I first started with my birds, um, I used to, well, I always say no better, do better. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know different. I did. Yeah. Anyways, I would towel them, mm -hmm. train them, lean them backwards and mm -hmm. inject the medication, not the juice, the medication. Mm -hmm. Um, that was very stressful for my birds. Mm -hmm. um, and I paired that with myself. I uh -huh. paired that whole behavior repertoire with the syringe. So it doesn't uh -huh. take long for that syringe to become a cue. Bam, uh -huh. fly yeah. away. So I had, um, once I started learning to do better, do different, I had to totally desensitize the site of the syringe. Yeah. I always uh -huh. had syringes in the refrigerator. So then, once in a while, I would go to the refrigerator to get the syringe. So that was an intermittent schedule of reinforcement that uh -huh. when I would go to the fridge, all of my birds would turn. Is uh -huh. she something or is she pulling out that thing that's associated with restraint? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so I had to totally counter condition all of that. Uh -huh. I did, I started with Rico and how I did that, like temperature can be a reinforcer. Rico liked warm water. Um, so I started with warm. And I noticed that by one day I was doing dishes next to the sink and uh -huh. he would reach over and grab some water out of the faucet. Yeah. And I was like, what is it about the water? Is it water? Is it the temperature of the water? Is it where the water is coming from? But it was the temperature of the water. So then I was just like, let's start delivering warm water from a syringe. And that's where I started counter conditioning with Rico. Okay. Yeah. What are okay. your thoughts on um, how you syringe train? Whether, cause I know there's like two different schools of thought and I, 
ice falling off our roof. Oh. Um, something you don't have to deal with out there. <laughs> I don't know any weather. I live in California. I only know earthquakes. That's it. <laughs> I'll take my snow. <laughs> But a lot of people will say, for example, um, you use pomegranate juice, and I see this on different Facebook groups, just put the medication in the syringe with the pomegranate juice. Uh -huh. And I always tell people, be careful with that, because you may yep. punish the behavior of the animal taking the pomegranate juice. Yeah. Uh -huh. So um, if we have a bird who, you know, they don't have an adverse reaction to the syringe, they've never seen a syringe before, um, what I like to do is start with an empty syringe, just like we're target training. Um, so you touch the syringe, you get a cookie, just a, an empty, boring syringe. And then from there, after we can repeat that a few times, I like to add water. I know it's an extra step, but um, I don't know. I had enough birds that went, whoa, that's a big change. And just even if you can touch the syringe that there's water in it, right? There's yeah. been a change that happened and then they get paid for that. And then from there, um, my next step that I like to do, and you know what, I know it's a lot of steps, but I feel like it's more practice under their belt and a stronger foundation when we get to the growth stuff, is I'll put a little drop at the end. And if you can take that little drop of water then you get a cookie <laughs> and then we go to a juice or medication. Something um, else that has taste. So you start yeah. with neutral, like a neutral stimulant. Yeah. yeah. And with her, um, what I like to do is um, I like to use two different syringes. So one has my pomegranate juice and one has my medication. So you get the gross and then you get the good stuff or you get the gross stuff and you still get paid. And I do that even more practicing just with juice. And people say, well, the reinforcer is in the syringe, but I want to extra pay her for going to that syringe. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I do the same thing. I do the same thing. I'll use two syringes. <laughs> First, I often have to desensitize, counter mm -hmm. the syringe. Yeah. And then I put the neutral stimulus, and once you touch, boom, you de mm -hmm. deliver through another syringe. Yeah, and the thing that's really, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Um, the thing that's really nice about being here um, is that, you know, the other technicians, um, you know, we have on our treatment sheets, takes medication this way in a food vehicle or from the syringe, or we're working on medication training. And so if we need to do some desensitization and counter conditioning to like a, a very strong aversive reaction, we can have one person on the other side of the room with the syringe and then somebody right there at the cage giving the treat. And you would take one little step. Okay, you're calm. Here's your treat. One little step. Okay, that was too much. Take a step back. And so having those two people there, it gives us so much more um, flexibility with they can say what they want with their body language. And we have all of the people and the space to respect that. Sure. And everybody there is probably on board with the training. Yeah, whether they like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm um, really fortunate that, you know, um, we've all found that once we start learning the new things that we want to implement and the birds start learning it, it just makes everybody's life so much easier. And, and when, no, I was going to say, when you see um, whatever your happy bird is, you know, when you see that bird eager to interact through, mm -hmm. I want to take my medication. Yeah. That is a reinforcer for a lot of people to continue to do what they're doing. Yes, it's especially here because, you know, we, we may have some visits where the owner comes in and, and they're nervous and I hear a lot, oh, they're not going to hurt you. Well, I, I don't want to hurt your bird. But then, you know, we work on this medication training or towel training or whatever it is. And then the next time they come back and the bird doesn't want to go home because they want to hang out with Auntie Mel. So, you know, it, it's great that we can all work on it together. And the, most of our, our bird owners are so happy to do that because we just want to do what's right for our kids. Sure. Sure. Yeah. 
And that's appreciated. That's appreciated. And it's nice that you have there in your clinic um, a couple of different aspects. One, the medical expertise. Mm -hmm. Two, the behavior expertise. And three, the training expertise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's nice that you have that all in one. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the other things you would... Um, let's talk, let's start talking outside of the, uh, clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we talked about, um, biting in the mm -hmm. that behavior serves a purpose for the animal. Yeah. 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 And so one of the things that I hear, um, is you have a bird, you're going to get bit no matter what. It does not have to, that bite serves a purpose for that bird. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I do yeah, not and want to get bit by Rocky. I do not want to get bit by the turkey vulture. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I yeah. Bit by the budgie either. The no. budgie may not hurt, but I know the bite from the budgie may not hurt, but I know if the budgie, Ollie, is doing that, he's stressed. It's a form of communication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you and, ignore it, something else will happen. Yeah. And hopefully, um, and many times this isn't the case, but hopefully leading up to that bite, there's other things that they can do to tell us, no, thank you. I don't like this or no, you need to stop what you're doing. Sometimes, um, you know, if we're not used to seeing that body language, they might puff up their feathers really big or, um, you know, hiss at you or lean away or fly away. If we're not used to seeing those little things. Um, sometimes, you know, they don't go through all of those steps. They just go straight from the beginning to, to the bite because that's what works. Um, so we see both ends of that spectrum. And um, sometimes, you know, it's, it's real subtle things, but that bite always means something. And especially with, um, you know, again, to talk about the um, veterinary visits, sometimes that's a, a fear response. We want this towel to go away, and so you bite to make it go away, um, and much less of a, a you know biting because you're aggressive or you know whatever you want to label your bird with. So yeah, yeah. and a lot of um, where do I want to go with this? Um, a lot of the animal. Well, and here's the thing. I was going to say, a lot of the animals I work with have a history of reinforcement for behaviors labeled as aggressive, mm -hmm. lunging, biting, um, a lot of other things, because I work with a lot of other things besides just birds, but mm -hmm. birds are the apple of my eye. I love them. I was just at a zoo a couple of weeks ago that said, we're working with all of the different species in their zoo. And they were just looking at me and they're like, the birds are the hardest ones for us to read. And I was like, you know, they're complex. Yeah. You know? And yeah. talk about behavior or uh, body language is behavior. Uh -huh. you know, like an open beak may be, oh, I'm interested. What is that? An open uh -huh. beak may be, I'm fearful. I'm uh -huh. going to defend myself. Um, it could, but it, it matters. What is? What else? What other behavior is happening? Yeah, you have to look at the whole picture. And, and then you have all of these species differences, and then you have the individual differences. Like being with Sage for so long, I know that she has totally different body language in certain circumstances than any other brown head parrot I've met. Totally different. So it's, it's always throwing you a curveball. So we have to be so observant. Yeah. Um, I was going something where that history of reinforcement. Um, you can teach an old dog new tricks. And when you take that statement and transfer it to the parrot world, um, you definitely can teach an old bird new tricks. Oh, yeah. They're Good super old awesome sometimes. Yeah. 50, 60, 70, 80 years, you better yeah. be, you can yeah. definitely retrain. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just absolutely. Yeah, because what made me think about that is Coco, I believe, is our oldest bird here. We say he's 30, but he's 
probably a little bit older than that, uh -huh. came to us. Well, I went to him. I saw him um, at the yeah. organization, and I was just like, what's this little guy's story? And um, he had a strong, you put your hands. Now, there's a difference, and I always tell people, be specific. When So, so yeah. you probably hear a lot of this, Melody. My bird's uh -huh. afraid of hands. Be specific. Um, yeah. Hands from five feet away, ten feet away, two feet uh -huh. away, or is it the pace at which your hands are moving? Uh huh. What's the consequence after the hand comes in so close? Yeah. yeah so I always, I always try and ask people. You know, paint me a picture. You know, if you if you paint it out so that anybody can see what it looks like, what what is that? It's like, you know, draw that extra information out. Yeah. So when people come to you at the clinic for help, Melody, what do you do? What do you suggest? Do you help them walk through right there? Um, yeah, a lot of it depends on if they have already had a, an exam or not. You know, if, if the bird is staying in the hospital, then we can do both at the same time. We can, you know, treat your bird. Um, for whatever is ailing them and then simultaneously work on what we need to. Um, but if it's an outpatient thing, you come in for an exam, um, many times we'll schedule it for another date um, because you just had your exam, your bird's probably stressed, maybe it wasn't in your schedule, and then we can talk ahead of time. I can get all of the information from you and then we can go from there. Well, actually, we just started doing, um, we call it cookie camp. Um, I like my little kitschy names, but um, it, it's just these little 30 minute training appointments that focus on just teaching veterinary behaviors. So working with the towel, working with medication training, um, getting into the carrier, things like that. So that's been going well. Um, okay, so they can, that's nice cookie camp so they can come in for small sessions with you uh -huh. you're the head uh -huh. trainer there, right yeah. uh -huh. tell us a little bit about let me get the graphic up here tell us a little bit about how did busy beaks what is busy beaks academy it, it's kind of um i mean it's a part of the medical center for birds um you know we work real closely together um but this is it's just it's my training company that um we do group classes and private lessons, and um, that, that's my baby. <laughs> this was created by you, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, th I think I had my first uh, group class in 2015, January. Um, and yeah, we just offer services to just parrots, and we've done um, a couple roosters. Uh, you know, you hear a lot about roosters attacking people, um, so help with that, and um, it's just a lot of fun. I love it, and I love that we can work so closely with the hospital um, because, you know, there's always that debate of is this a medical problem or is it a behavioral problem, but they're, they're always intertwined. You can't have one aspect without the other. So Busy Beaks Academy is something that you offer only through there, through the center? Uh, no, no, we, we're open for our clients or non-clients. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. And um, so here's your website. We've got some questions happening too, and it's from mm -hmm. some people with, uh, uh, well, it doesn't matter. Um, so here's your website, busybeaksacademy.com. Yep. And how do people, you have an email address that if people need to get in touch with you. Yes. Right here at Melody at busybeaksacademy.com. Uh -huh. um, so interesting. Are you ready for some questions? Yes. Okay. Let's do it. Um, let's make some more room. What was your bird's name? This is Sage. Sage. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. Wow. Must be a lot of ice on our roof. Um, Laura Zitzelberger, she is the director of operations here in White House, Ohio for Nature's Nursery, the Wildlife Rehab Center where I train, where we have 
we have their turkey vulture here, Willie. Mm -hmm. So Laura says, do you find it hard to evaluate a bird for behavior since you are seeing them in an already stressful situation? Yeah, so a lot of times um, if the bird is already in for an exam, the doctor who's seeing them will pull me in and will collaborate about what might be going on. Uh, and then, you know, if it is something that in this moment it's too stressful for the bird, then we'll follow up at another time or I will go to their home. Like if it's something that getting your bird in the carrier is damaging to your relationship because they won't go in the carrier, you have to towel them, whatever it is, then that's when I go to their house. And sometimes that's more helpful because you can see the setup and you get a lot more of the picture that way. Um, I ask for videos a lot and that's really helpful to you because you know, when we describe behavior, sometimes we are very passionate because it's our lives and our family or birds. And so you get into that storyteller mode. And so the videos and seeing things in person can can really help you get more information. Sure. Get a more accurate read on true behavior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where the behavior is actually happening. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Laura also asked, does it. Does it what is it usually an on I'm, I'm assuming she's saying it ongoing consults or yeah so a lot of times um many times you know we don't want to um overwhelm the birds or the owners and so you kind of take things step at a time and that helps people to be more successful too i think you know you get a little bit of homework and we reach this one goal and then we move on to the next thing and many times it's ongoing also because we, we run into bumps in the road we have questions and so there's follow-up there's always adjustments you know many times we make a plan to turn right but then you have to turn left and then go forward and you yeah. know yeah exactly all to get to the same place but we'll have to be flexible in that and then i think that that does make it more of a, a constant thing yeah. Um, so, Melody, then do you do any work online? Yeah, um, we actually just started doing lessons through Zoom, um, which I love because you can record the lessons. Love it. Yeah. Love. Any other piece of advice? Um, like a lot of times I'll say, I try to say, I mean, two of my best pieces of advice that I give people are keep your animal used to change. Mm -hmm. um, and the second one, I just forgot what it was. That's how important it is. <laughs> <laughs> keep your animal used to change. Um, and a lot of times I'll do that through training. Mm -hmm. Like you always hear me say, if that animal can see, hear, smell, or feel you, you are training it, whether you realize it or not. The key question Absolutely. is, what are you training? So mm -hmm. when you keep them used to change, and we'll stick with parrots, such as, I mean, a change, and tell me if you see this, like some people, if they were to move a perch from one side of a cage to another, that could be an extremely stressful situation to a bird. That, yeah. That's totally not used to change. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Even, um, you know, we, we hear it a lot. And if the owners are okay with it, I like to try and, well, maybe we should try this. But, you know, we, we have our towels on the bottom drawer here. And we'll, when we go to get the bird in the towel, and we've got lots of different, like, low stress ways that we, we try to do that. Um, but if, we, if I grab like a red towel, and they go, oh, no, they only like blue towels. And I go, well, we could try the red towel and see how it goes. And yeah. sometimes it is really that it's just the red towel. And sometimes it's, hey, they did really good. Maybe next time we'll try a yellow towel. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I've always, um, you know, when I worked with dogs and cats, it was a lot of, um, you know, you take the animals in the back. And it, it was much more of like a, you have to be efficient with your time. And the appointments were much shorter. And, you know, so... Here we try and take our time with things and then everything's in the bag. But uh, here, you know, I'm able to do things with the client in the room with us. 
and I'm able to, you know, ask them what's their reinforcer? How does this go? How do they like to step up? You know, you we get these animals from the zoos that are that are only left hand stepper uppers. You offer them with the right hand and they go, what do you want? What is that? Yeah. They have no idea. So, you know, being able to ask the owner, how does this work for your bird and be able to listen to that? And sometimes we can see if it'll work out a different way. And sometimes it's like, that's your bird, you know, and there's no budging with that right now. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's ahead. kind of a, a luxury that um, I didn't really have before working with dogs and cats because you didn't have time for it. And not that every dog and cat hospital is this way, but that's just my experience. Yeah. Um, something else I wanted, I'm rolling my chair over my computer cord. Something oh. else, I mean, you had mentioned, um, you had mentioned uh, sometimes the bird's afraid of the red towel. And I find that a lot of times it's the human afraid to try any type of change because they don't think their bird can handle it. Yes. When yeah. actually, their bird can it's just we don't think they can yeah restrict yeah. them a lot yeah yeah and um you know every once in a while often you know we, we try something new or you know if um they stay here for a couple days and then um you know we go oh we, we didn't have any red towels and so we tried these colors and it did really well maybe we can try it next time you know things like that yeah and, yeah. Do you, um, and, and foraging is a great way to keep your bird used to change. It yes. keeps them searching, keeps them learning, keeps them trying uh -huh. different things. Uh -huh. um, parrots are very manipulative and they learn through manipulation. Uh -huh. Manipulation means each time they try it, they get a different outcome. Uh -huh. And they start learning from which outcome do I want. Uh -huh. A lot of times people get stuck in a rut by just giving the same old thing because my parent liked that like three years ago, so they must still like it. Right. Yeah. And, you know, one of the cool things about foraging, too, is that, you know, they, that's a part where they look forward to that change. You, know, you don't always know what you're going to get for breakfast or dinner. And so they, you know, look forward to that change. Yeah. Yeah, um, they look forward to that change and they, I mean, I don't know what's going on in their head, but based on their behavior, the more you shape those subtle complexities, uh -huh. the more curious the bird, you see the more curious the bird gets. Yes. Um, you know, I tell people don't punish that curiosity because a lot of times people are like, oh, he likes this, so he should be okay with this. Let's stick this in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, in a lot of birds, I think a lot of people tend to forget that they're prey. Mm -hmm. um, they use those wings to fly away or yeah. they use those legs to run away. Uh -huh. um, if I present, I mean, Suki is great here. I'm trying to get this uh, sun coming through my Venetian blind off my forehead. <laughs> so I'm giving up. Um, Suki, our blue-fronted Amazon, such, I mean, that that behavior is there. And when she's sitting on your hand, when I'm working with uh, Lindsay, one of our volunteers here, she tries to present something, say Suki's sitting on her hand. Uh -huh. That's something. The subtle body language is just this. Uh -huh. you know, just, yeah. And then I'm just like, pull your hand away. She's not comfortable with what something uh -huh. about how we're presenting this or what we're presenting. Yeah. Um, we've made all this progress, paying attention to just that subtle lean back away from whatever you're presenting. That's communication. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, if they don't have that subtle lean and it's just that they, they take off, you know, I'm, I'm sure you see it a lot that, you know, we're, we get a lot that I want to train my birds, so I'm going to trim the wings. I mean, you don't have to, that, that's important stuff. If they fly off, then that means they're not comfortable. It doesn't mean that they're any less trainable. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times, um. People think I'm, I'm, I'm against clipping wings. There's, I can't 
I don't know what's best for you and your bird and your life. I, yeah, absolutely. I've lived in a home where it wasn't safe to have my birds flighted. And now I'm somewhere where it is safe. And, you know, one of my birds, when I keep him flighted and he will constantly smack into the window. So that's not safe. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's absolutely um, not to say that you shouldn't trim your wings or you should. But um, as far as like a needed for training, you know, it, it's a good, good information for you from your bird. Yeah. A lot of times I'll say here, um, if you're clipping to modify a behavior issue, you're probably going to reinforce another very undesired one. Absolutely. Yeah. Because if you can't fly away, then how else are you going to say no? There's a lot of different ways. It just might not be one that you like as much. But like you said, it still works for the bird. Yeah. Here's the awesome Patricia Anderson. Flighted birds need to be trained to develop confidence in their surroundings and their owners. Mm -hmm. um, we just did a webinar two weeks ago on beginning flight. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked all about, you know, how to create a safe environment for a flighted bird. Mm -hmm. There's, di there's different ways you can. Um, and something else we discussed was, oh, here's another thing. Um, so a lot of people want their birds to fly. If your, your bird may be a beautiful flyer, but it doesn't know how to land. Yeah. Which will punish the behavior of the bird taking off in flight. So first teach the bird how to land, mm -hmm. then move to uh, distance and shaping flight. Um, but for a bird that's not used to flying, and all of a sudden it's flying, it's used to walking and information passes by at this pace and they have that, uh -huh. control. all of a sudden they're flying and information is going like this and they can't, they don't, they haven't developed yet the skills to mm -hmm. process that information for how fast it's going by their head. Yeah. That can be a very scary thing. Yeah. Um, somebody's asking a question for some reason, some of the questions off to the right, I can't finish seeing them. I'm going to bring this up here. Melody Carrie mm -hmm. says in regards to change, I didn't think my bird responded well to change in that she found safety and sameness, safety, state safety and predictability because she was a prey animal. Was this correct? Let's talk about this Melody. Yeah. Um, predictability has its place. It does. Uh, extremely predictable with an animal that's very fearful. Mm -hmm. But over time, I'm going to start changing. I'm yeah, start and, change. and the, one of the good reasons for that is because we, we can only predict and make things the same for so much. There's so much stuff that is out of our control. You know, if we're doing things exactly the same and then uh, – some snow falls off of the roof or yeah. ice or, you know, yeah. And then there's a, a big bang that we, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, and there, there's so many things that are out of our control that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily um, think to train for that one specific thing because then we would, you know, have lists that are miles long, but having some kind of um, variability may help with that. Well, in here, um, I'll be very predictable, and it's usually if we bring in, like I said, Director of Operations is on here, uh, Laura Zitzelberger from Nature's Nursery. A lot of times I bring in their animals here for training, wild, injured animals that cannot be released. Uh -huh. um, I will be extremely predictable in the beginning. Um, but then over time, I, I, I shape that calmness of staying calm and being comfortable mm -hmm. in an environment that starts to change where kids are up and walking around behind in front. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, snow falls off the roof out the window. Yeah. Something mm -hmm. else. Uh, there was a couple of years ago, a death in our family. I mm -hmm. am so glad I got, you know, my, my animals were used to change some days with the birds. I will intentionally leave them in the cage all day. Mm -hmm. um, but I make sure there's other things for them to do, but I don't yeah. want them being stressed by not being able to get out of the cage because they're used to always getting out of the cage. Mm -hmm. um, and I get them used to 
Sometimes you have people, sometimes you don't have people. Uh -huh. Nothing here usually happens at a certain time because when that routine is broken, such as death in the family, uh -huh. um, that's a huge change. Yeah. That's out of your, all of a sudden it's out of your control and boom, you guys are in your cages for three days. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so I've been watching you with Sage throughout the past hour. You've been doing very good with her. I mean, not that you need to hear that from me. No, thank uh, you. But I can she's, see. She's done you, a good yeah. number on her cupcakes here. <laughs> yeah. I can see you intermittently reinforcing staying on the perch. Uh -huh. And she's done great. She's having fun. <laughs> so, um, just let's um let's take one more question you want to melody you have time we've got yeah yeah absolutely you believe it's already been an hour no <laughs> i not feel like that time flies pun intended on coffee with the critters <laughs> <laughs> so this is from beth steptoe she's in the parrot project she says how do you incorporate environmental change for blind parrots? I suspect my older mm -hmm. Amazon will be developing cataracts and have limited vision. This is yeah. perfect for you, yeah. Melody. Yeah, so um, you know, I'm curious to hear what you have to say too, but um, I have my Yellowknife Amazon has uh, one eye. Well, he, he has one that's just kind of deflated, so there's no vision there. And then I used to have a, a Congo Gray who was maybe like 90% blind. Um, and some, a big part of what, anytime we made changes, um, it, it took a lot for that, for at least for my Gray to kind of get reoriented. Um, so new toys and things was no problem for him. Um, but changing the perches, changing the food, and you have to, you know, help make sure that you can direct them to where they need to go. Um, I find myself talking a lot with him, uh, even though I know that a lot of what I'm saying, um, you know, he's not understanding. But it's especially finding comfort in your voice. Yeah. And, you know, I'll, you know, say, hey, can I pick you up? Like, it's announced that my hand is coming. And, it, you know, even though he's not recognizing what I'm saying, um, you know, he gets used to those patterns. You know, I hear your voice and maybe your hand's going to come. Um, and then, you know, moving the toys around and things, like I said, was never a problem. But moving perches around or especially the, the food dishes. Um, my gray had several food dishes. He was also was very old. Sam seems a little younger, right? Uh, I was told Sam is at least 23 years old. Okay, my guy was 44. Um, and so lots of arthritis and things too. So moving things around for him was kind of a bigger deal. Yeah. Um, you know, but toys and things, no problem. We used to get him um, little boxes and he would just go crazy on them, make little holes and then go in there and, and talk so it all echoed and things. Anyhow, um, and then for my Amazon, Sammy, um, you know, I do a lot more just kind of announcing myself. And then when we're doing training, um, I always, you know, I have to go on the good eye. Um, and then a lot of what we do, too, when I offer him treats, it's uh, on a spoon because it's a much larger thing for him to see.